Well, thank you, Dan, and good evening to everyone. Certainly a, a very relevant topic today, particularly as we see different types of sufferings going on due to natural calamities, due to illness, due to sickness, and understanding that there is, in fact, a, a purpose to many of these things, recognizing that their impact on society, of which we are a part, has uh, an influence on, on how our lives, uh, uh, the experiences with, that we live through. So when we look at the idea of why does God uh, allow suffering, as we saw in the, the video, often it pr brings to mind the notion of God, I don't understand suffering. I don't understand if there is a reason, a purpose behind it. And seemingly the existence of suffering, as Dan has commented, often challenges the belief or the confidence of many that God even exists. If he was such a compassionate God, why would he allow these hardships to be experienced by mankind? So when you think about the definition of suffering, um, we can think about it as a state of undergoing pain, distress, or hardship. And it's all those different aspects. Some sufferings might be more extreme. Some of them might result in physical uh, affliction. Some might be more emotional or psychological. But all of them uh, impose upon us a certain degree of hardship, certain challenges that we're going to face uh, as a result of these sufferings. And primarily what we're going to focus on tonight is those that impact uh, at a, a, a higher societal level, those things that affect the environment in which we would live. Now, as we commented on in the video, there was a German philosopher uh, back in the mid 1800s who made this famous statement, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And it's used very much as uh, an affirmation of resilience. Just keep a stiff upper lip and everything will be okay. And although it might inspire us to continue, to continue to, to bear under the, the challenges of the circumstances, it doesn't present much hope or much light or much relief. It merely says, just keep going. Uh, and although that can be important, uh, that is, stands in stark contrast to what we can find described for us in the Bible. Now, the Bible talks about different types of suffering. We think about those natural occurring disasters. You can think about floods and tornadoes, uh, those things that uh, are impacted by our environment. We can think of man-made calamities. Some of these are connected with uh, naturally occurring disasters, perhaps, but the, the bulk of them are attributable to certain initiatives or actions that are taken by man that result in the hardships being imposed or afflicted onto other individuals. And lastly, there are those God-directed catastrophes, those that... Uh, have a, a relation to how God has been interacting with society. And it might be rather surprising for us to think that there are God-directed catastrophes, and we can see evidence of those as we go through the Bible tonight. So we're going to use a bit of an investigation process. Um, we're going to be looking at examples in the Bible. Obviously, that's our focus, focus point as we start to look for evidence internally within the Old and New Testaments that testify to the existence uh, and the purpose of these different types of, of sufferings and what they're in fact uh, at times attributable to. Then we're gonna look at what are some of the governing principles, some of those truths that uh, are evident from this pattern that we might see in these various types of sufferings. And lastly, we're gonna look at lessons for us so that we can benefit from what the Bible has to say about these types of sufferings that in fact, uh, are ongoing today in society. So first we have those natural occurring disasters. And just as we were to step through the Old Testament and move into the New Testament, we can see that there is recorded evidence of these naturally occurring disasters. We have a regional famine that's described in uh, the land of Canaan in the Old Testament in the book of Genesis in Genesis chapter 12. That's then followed by a much broader famine, which in fact uh, impacts the then habited uh, world. And it's going to, to drive the people to, to seek relief by going into the area of Egypt to seek food, uh, recognizing that this was at this time a, a more agricultural based society. And that's recorded for us in Genesis 41. Now, in the case of Egypt, one of the reasons why it was able to endure uh, during a time of famine when water was scarce was that it re relied on the regular annual flooding of the Nile River. 
Now, for those who can remember a bit about history, that doesn't occur right now because there are a series of dams that are built upstream along the Nile that regulate the, the outflow of the water into the Nile Delta and ultimately into the Mediterranean Sea. But that annual flooding, although it was harmful, was also beneficial in that it brought a lot of rich nutrients down into those fertile growing lands which allowed the, the, the crops to be uh, well uh, fertilized and given good nutrients such that there was an abundance of growth. Then we have what's described in the New Testament as a tower that falls. It's the Tower of Siloam. And in fact, it kills 18 people. Uh, and the Lord Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 13 uses this as an example of where sufferings occur, which are not attributable to any uh, uh, wrong actions on the part of those who were in the immediate vicinity of the tower, but it was merely a regrettable tragedy that happened when this tower, whether it was improperly built or whether due to erosion, ultimately collapsed and took 18 lives. In Acts chapter 27, we have described for us an intense storm that resulted in a shipwreck that the Apostle Paul was on this vessel that was transporting him uh, to Rome to stand before Caesar. And this was a, a shipwreck occurred in which it was uh, a problematic to be traveling on the Mediterranean in, in this season. And there was a good likelihood that this was going to occur. So some natural disasters like the flooding of the Nile, like this fierce storm in Acts 27, are things that regularly occur due to seasonal activity, but they're still traumatic. They still result in great losses of life or losses of, of good and livelihood. Um, and that's an evidence that we can find in the New Testament. Now, there are other uh, disasters which are natural in, in their occurrence, but perhaps are not on the same order of magnitude or scale that we find from those early uh, listings. And there can be those that are accidental deaths where two are working alongside one another. And just due to an inadvertent uh, movement, there is a, a death uh, of one of those individuals as a consequence of the activity. And we have an example of that in Deuteronomy 19. And then we have those cases where there's even injury of livestock, where there's a loss of life um, um, because the, the, the livestock has injured a person. And under the law, it was required that if that was a, a regular or habitual behavior of the livestock, uh, that it should be put down. So those are personal injuries. So we have those large scale and we have those small scale. All of them are naturally occurring. They're facets of life, day-to-day -day existence. But when we, when we look at the, uh, the Old Testament, we can see examples that those conditions are in fact described for us. In the record of Ecclesiastes, we have a simple statement made. Again, I saw under the sun, time and chance happened to them all. So there is a certain natural order that has been established by God. There's certain laws of physics. There's certain seasonal aspects which occur. And ultimately, they, they, the effects of them can regularly impact the lives of all. And as the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew 5 describes, it says that for he, God, makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. So it's independent of our behavior. It's independent of choices that we make. God, in his mercy, allows the, the earth to be nurtured with sun and with rain, and he will provide those resources to all mankind. Now, when we think about lessons from the, the, the natural occurring disasters, there's several things that we can observe. It helps to remind us how frail we are and how precious life is. And certainly the pandemic has driven that home in a very severe way. There are both regular, seasonal, and unexpected types of disasters. Those that we can predict or maybe be able to have an early indication of, such as a flood where we might see rain taking place at a, a tributaries that are upstream of a large uh, uh, river. And ultimately we know over the course of the time that flooding will ensue as those waters travel by gravity uh, through a natural process uh, and through ele elevation changes down to uh, the, the exit point of those rivers. Some events though, however, we can forecast. You can think of a statement made by the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew's gospel, where they could observe the weather conditions, and this was occurring right in New Testament times, 
And we still follow by these same rules of thumb that if the weather conditions were, were, were showing that uh, there was pleasant, favorable conditions in the evening, it was likely that the weather would be nice the next day. By contrast, though, if the weather was uh, unfavorable, if it was gloomy and overcast in the morning, it was quite likely that later in that day they would experience some sort of uh, event uh, weather related. But most of these are in fact beyond our control. We can observe the circumstances, but we can't really impact them or influence them because they're a, a bond beyond our uh, area of activity. And accidents unfortunately can just happen and we can all bear evidence of that where uh, unexpectedly someone leaves our house and that's the last time we see them. They lose their life in a, in a traffic accident. And the occurrence of this type of suffering, though, should not be considered as evidence that God does not care or exist. God has established an order or an arrangement. He's de demonstrated to us and told us through the scriptures that our lives are for a short period and that time and chance happeneth to all men. And that regrettably, some of these natural occurring calamities are merely uh, a matter of, of circumstance. But there are, by contrast, those that are man-made, those horrific uh, challenges that occur, those losses of life because of the influence of, of mankind. And we can see evidence of that particular type of suffering in, in the Old Testament starting, where we have the murdering of one's brother right in the early pages of the book of Genesis. In the middle of uh, or in Genesis 14, we have a large-scale military invasion. So there were on armed conflicts of, of a significant scale that would have resulted in uh, many to lose their life. But by contrast, there were those who were preserved by God, even though that they were taken, taken captive. So we can see that God at times will take certain precautions or steps to safeguard uh, his people. There were disputes over water rights, and that's something we can even see today uh, in the book of Genesis. There was an, a deception about one's inheritance, and we can see about those conflicts going on even in, in companies like Rogers, where we have this inheritance dispute about the, uh, the, the, the wealth of Ted Rogers. We have matrimonial deceptions and mass murder that are described. So the Bible is very honest about what occurs in the society of mankind and paints a very stark picture at times that can make us feel a little, little uncomfortable. But these same hardships also occurred in the New Testament. There were those who were sold into slavery. And we can see that that would be a, a, a tremendous suffering that one would undergo to be uh, put out of a family and to be sold for money and to be cut off for your family for a number of years. There was an attempted uh, action by Pharaoh to in fact put together all of the, 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 the firstborn uh, children in, in the time of Egypt, which was not followed through with due to the faithful actions of some midwives. There were abuses in slavery and the nation of Israel would experience this in the time that they were in Egypt. So when we think about these actions, there are some common principles that occur as a result of choices that man makes, Des decisions he makes as far as how he's going to exercise his own behavior. And it's described quite nicely for us in the record to James, where it says, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. So we can see all of the violent, aggressive actions, and they're all attributable to man's de desire to, to satisfy his own passions and his own interests. And unfortunately, that's very characteristic of man-made calamities. So what are the lessons that we can learn from these man-made calamities? Well, we learned that man is not inherently good. And that's a thought that seems to be going around quite common today, that inherently there is a goodness in man. But the Bible, unfortunately, would paint a very different picture. Man is motivated by his self-interest and self-gratification. And at times that can serve the benefits of others. And in other cases, it can be quite self-serving and be a detriment to others. And God's principles from the Bible can help to regulate these natural tendencies and the behavior of man. 
And that was really the whole point of a simple uh, set of commandments that were given in the book of Exodus, which we refer to as the Ten Commandments. They were there for that reason. They were there to preserve the relationship with God, and as importantly, to preserve the correct relationship with those that they would live amongst. And as the Lord Jesus Christ would say in, in Mark chapter 7, for from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts and sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. Not particularly attractive qualities to be emanating from the heart of man, but that's the reality. And it corresponds with what we see in both the Old and the New Testament, when our behavior isn't regulated by the principles of God. So what are those God-directed calamities? These are some that we may be familiar with in the Old Testament, particularly the flood in the days of Noah. It was there for a purpose and recorded in Genesis 6, the global famine. And you can see that some of these depend upon the perspective of how you view them. From outside of, of a, a biblical attitude, it would appear that it was just a natural disaster. But ultimately in the book of Genesis in, in chapter 41, there's a different perspective given. So I'll lead, let you look at that one on your own. The 10 plagues in Egypt, recorded in Exodus 7 and through chapters 12. The drowning of Pharaoh and his army. These were those examples of God-directed calamities, where there was a loss of life. It was directed by God because he had a greater purpose in mind. The death of Israel's first generation that we'd have recorded in the book of Numbers. And then the destruction of Judah and Jerusalem by the Babylonian forces as uh, prophesied and ultimately uh, described in 2 Kings 25. And then we would have the greatest calamity uh, that was God directed, which was in fact the death of Jesus of Nazareth. But once again, it was for a purpose. And here we have some principles for us from Psalm 9, where we have this described, the Lord is known by his acts of justice. And that's how we need to look at those God-directed catastrophes. These are acts of justice because they're moderated by God himself. The wicked are ensnared by the works of their hands. The wicked go down to the realm of the dead, all the nations that forget God. But God will never forget the needy. The hope of the afflicted will never perish. So you can see that God has a different point of view or perspective on those that are desire to, to be uh, obedient to him and to follow his ways as compared to those nations who choose to follow their, their own path. So what are the lessons from the God-directed catastrophes? Well, God only intervenes in man's affairs when it is needful. He doesn't do it uh, in a haphazard way. It's for a purpose. And we can see here in Psalm 18, behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love, that he may deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in, in famine. And we can see examples of that book back in the book of Genesis. Our souls wait for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. And God-directed catastrophes are acts of justice, which are intended to declare that man, man, that he exists and that he's in control. And that's important for us to remember. And God keeps a watchful eye over those who fear him. And although they will experience other forms of suffering, he will still preserve them, them as described in this particular psalm. So as we look at the types of suffering in the Bible that are impacting the world, we can see those that are natural occurring, those that are man-made or as a result of man's actions, and those that are God-directed. And what we have learned is that from the examples in the Bible, we have evidence, and that there are important governing principles that we need to be aware of. And especially, we need to benefit from the lessons about what do we take away from these examples of suffering. If you found this video helpful, then make sure to go to our website to find other Bible study materials. And also, don't forget to take the quiz by using the link down below. If you take enough quizzes, you'll earn some awesome rewards, as well as some very useful Bible study tools. We at Bible Basics Webinar also specialize in individual and small group Bible studies. You can text us by using the phone number that's also down in the description, as well as our email to get more information about our Zoom and in-person classes. And of course, thank you so much for watching Bible Basics Webinar, where we use the Bible to learn about.